Chapter 7 July 10th Spoke a brig from Rio, bound to Norfolk. Weather hazy with a light baffling wind from the eastward. Today Hartman Rogers died, having been attacked on the 8th with spasms after drinking a glass of grog. This man was of the cook's party, and one upon whom Peters placed his main reliance. He told Augustus that he believed the mate had poisoned him, and that he expected if he did not be on the lookout, his own turn would come shortly. There were only now himself, Jones, and the cook belonging to his own gang. On the other side, there were five. He had spoken to Jones about taking the command from the mate, but the project having been coolly received, he had been deterred from pressing the matter any further, or from saying anything to the cook. It was well, as it happened, that he was so prudent, for in the afternoon the cook expressed his determination of siding with the mate, and went over formally to that party, while Jones took an opportunity of quarreling with Peters, and hinted that he would let the mate know of the plan and agitation. There was now, evidently, no time to be lost, and Peters expressed his determination of attempting to take the vessel at all hazards, provided Augustus would lend him his aid. My friend at once assured him of his willingness to enter into any plan for that purpose, and thinking the opportunity a favorable one, made known the fact of my being on board. At this the hybrid was not more astonished than delighted, as he had had no reliance whatever upon Jones, whom he already considered as belonging to the party of the mate. They went below immediately, when Augustus called to me by name, and Peters and myself were soon made acquainted. It was agreed that we should attempt to retake the vessel upon the first good opportunity, leaving Jones altogether out of our counsels. In the event of success, we were to run the brig into the first port that offered, and deliver her up. The desertion of his party had frustrated Peter's design of going into the Pacific, an adventure which could not be accomplished without a crew, and he depended upon either getting acquittal upon trial, or the score of insanity, which he solemnly avowed had agitated him in lending his aid to the mutiny, or upon obtaining a pardon, if found guilty, through the representations of Augustus and myself. Our deliberations were interrupted for the present by the cry of, All hands take and sail! and Peters and Augustus ran up on deck. As usual, the crew were nearly all drunk, and before sail could be properly taken in, a violent squall laid the brig on her beam ends. By keeping her away, however, she righted, having shipped a good deal of water. Scarcely was everything secure when another squall took the vessel, and immediately another one afterward, no damage being done. There was every appearance of a gale of wind, which indeed shortly came on with great fury from the northward and westward. All was made as snug as possible, and we laid to, as usual, under a close-reefed foresail. As night drew on, the wind increased in violence with a remarkably heavy sea. Peters now came into the forecastle with Augustus, and we resumed our deliberations. We agreed that no opportunity could be more favorable than the present for carrying our designs into effect, as an attempt at such a moment would never be anticipated. As the brig was snugly laid to, there would be no necessity of maneuvering her until good weather, when, if we succeeded in our attempt, we might liberate one, or perhaps two of the men, to aid us in taking her to port. The main difficulty was the great disproportion in our forces. There were only three of us, and in the cabin there were nine. All the arms on board, too, were in their possession, with the exception of a pair of small pistols which Peters had concealed about his person, and the large seaman's knife which he always wore in the waistband of his pantaloons. From certain indications, too, such, for example, as there being no such thing as an axe or a hand spike lying in their customary places, we began to fear that the mate had his suspicions at least in regard to Peters, and that he would let slip no opportunity in getting rid of him. It was clear, indeed, that what we should determine to do could not be done too soon. Still, the odds were too much against us to allow of our proceeding without the greatest caution. Peters proposed that he should go up on deck and enter into conversation with the watch, Alan, when he would be able to throw him into the sea without trouble 
and without making any disturbance by seizing a good opportunity, that Augustus and myself should then come up and endeavor to provide ourselves with some kind of weapons from the deck, and that we should then make a rush together and secure the companionway before any opposition could be offered. I objected to this, because I could not believe that the mate, who was a cunning fellow in all matters, which did not affect his superstitious prejudices, would suffer himself to be so easily entrapped. The very fact of there being a watch on deck at all was sufficient proof that he was upon the alert, it not being usual except in vessels where discipline is most rigidly enforced to station a watch on deck when a vessel is lying to in a gale of wind. As I address myself principally, if not altogether, to persons who have never been to sea, it may be as well to state the exact condition of a vessel under such circumstances. Lying to, or, in sea parlance, lying to, is a measure resorted to for various purposes, and effected in various manners. In moderate weather it is frequently done with a view of merely bringing the vessel to a standstill, to wait for another vessel or any similar object. If the vessel which lies to is under full sail, the maneuver is usually accomplished by throwing round some portion of her sails, so as to let the wind take them back when she becomes stationary. But we are now speaking of lying to in a gale of wind. This is done when the wind is ahead and too violent to admit of carrying sail without danger of capsizing, and sometimes even when the wind is fair but the sea too heavy for the vessel to be put before it. If a vessel be suffered to scud before the wind in a very heavy sea, much damage is usually done her by the shipping of water over her stern, and sometimes by the violent plunges she makes forward. This maneuver, then, is seldom resorted to in such case, unless through necessity. When the vessel is in a leaky condition, she is often put before the wind, even in the heaviest seas, for, when lying to, her seams are sure to be greatly opened by her violent straining, and it is not so much the case when scudding. Often, too, it becomes necessary to scud a vessel, either when the blast is so exceedingly furious as to tear in pieces the sail which is employed with a view of bringing her head to the wind, or when, through the false modeling of the frame or other causes, this main object cannot be effected. Vessels in a gale of wind are laid to in different manners, according to their peculiar construction. Some lie to best under a foresail, and this, I believe, is the sail most usually employed. Large square-rigged vessels have sails for the express purpose called storm stay sails, but the jib is occasionally employed by itself. Sometimes the jib and foresail, or a double-reefed foresail, and not unfrequently the after sails, are made use of. Four top cells are very often found to answer the purpose better than any other species of cell. The grampus was generally laid to under a close-reefed foresail. When a vessel is to be laid to, her head is brought up to the wind, just so nearly as to feel the cell under which she lies when hauled flat aft, that is, when brought diagonally across the vessel. This being done, the bows point within a few degrees of the direction from which the wind issues, and the windward bow, of course, receives the shock of the waves. In this situation, a good vessel will ride out a very heavy gale of wind without shipping a drop of water, and without any further attention being requested on part of the crew. The helm is usually lashed down, but this is altogether unnecessary, except on account of the noise it makes when loose, for the rudder has no effect upon the vessel when lying to. Indeed, the helm had far better be left loose than lashed very fast, for the rudder is apt to be torn off by heavy seas if there be no room for the helm to play. As long as the sail holds, a well-modeled vessel will maintain her situation, and ride every sea, as if instinct with life and reason. If the violence of the wind, however, should tear the sail into pieces, a feat which it requires a perfect hurricane to accomplish under ordinary circumstances, there is then imminent danger. The vessel falls off from the wind, and, coming broadside to the sea, is completely at its mercy. The only resource in this case is to put her quietly before the wind, letting her scud until some other sail can be set. Some vessels will lie to under no sail whatever, but such are not to be trusted at sea. But to return from this digression, 
It had never been customary with the mate to have any watch on deck when lying to in a gale of wind, and the fact that he had now had one, coupled with the circumstance of the missing axes and hand spikes, fully convinced us that the crew were too well on the watch to be taken by surprise in the manner Peters had suggested. Something, however, was to be done, and that with as little delay as practicable, for there could be no doubt that a suspicion having been once entertained against Peters, he would be sacrificed upon the earliest occasion, and one would certainly be either found or made upon the breaking of the gale. Augustus now suggested that if Peters could contrive to remove, under any pretext, the piece of chain cable which lay over the trap in the stateroom, we might possibly be able to come upon them unawares by means of the hold, but a little reflection convinced us that the vessel rolled and pitched too violently for any attempt of that nature. By good fortune, I at length hit upon the idea of working upon the superstitious terrors and guilty conscience of the mate. It will be remembered that one of the crew, Hartman Rogers, had died during the morning, having been attacked two days before with spasms after drinking some spirits and water. Peters had expressed to us his opinion that this man had been poisoned by the mate, and for this belief he had reasons, so he said, which were incontrovertible but which he could not be prevailed upon to explain to us, this wayward refusal being only in keeping with other points of his singular character. But whether or not he had any better grounds for suspecting the mate than we had ourselves, we were easily led to fall in with his suspicion, and determined to act accordingly. Rogers had died about eleven in the forenoon, in violent convulsions, and the corpse presented in a few minutes after death one of the most horrid and loathsome spectacles I ever remember to have seen. The stomach was swollen immensely, like that of a man who has been drowned and lain under water for many weeks. The hands were in the same condition, while the face was shrunken, shriveled, and of a chalky whiteness, except where relieved by two or three glaring red blotches like those occasioned by the erysipelas. One of those blotches extended diagonally across the face, completely covering up an eye as if with a band of red velvet. In this disgusting condition, the body had been brought up from the cabin at noon to be thrown overboard, when the mate getting a glimpse of it, for he now saw it for the first time, and being either touched with remorse for his crime or struck with terror at so horrible a sight, ordered the men to sew the body up in its hammock and allow it the usual rites of sea burial. Having given these directions, he went below, as if to avoid any further sight of his victim. While preparations were making to obey his orders, the gale came on with great fury, and the design was abandoned for the present. The corpse, left to itself, was washed into the larboard scuppers, where it still lay at the time of which I speak, floundering about with the furious lurches of the brig. Having arranged our plan, we set about putting it in execution as speedily as possible. Peters went upon deck and, as he had anticipated, was immediately accosted by Allen, who appeared to be stationed more as a watch upon the forecastle than for any other purpose. The fate of this villain, however, was speedily and silently decided, for Peters approaching him in a careless manner, as if about to address him, seized him by the throat, and, before he could utter a single cry, tossed him over the bulwarks. He then called to us, and we came up. Our first precaution was to look about for something with which to arm ourselves, and in doing this we had proceeded with great care, for it was impossible to stand on deck in an instant without holding fast, and violent seas broke over the vessel at every plunge forward. It was indispensable, too, that we should be quick in our operations, for every minute we expected the mate to be up to set the pumps going, as it was evident the brig must be taken in water very fast. After searching about for some time, we could find nothing more fit for our purpose than the two pump handles, one of which Augustus took, and I the other. Having secured these, we stripped off the shirt of the corpse and dropped the body overboard. Peters and myself then went below, leaving Augustus to watch upon the deck, where he took his station just where Alan had been placed, and with his back to the cabin companionway, so that, if any of the mate's gang should come up, he might suppose it was the watch. As soon as I got below, I commenced disguising myself so as to represent the corpse of Rogers. 
The shirt which we had taken from the body aided us very much, for it was of singular form and character, and easily recognizable, a kind of smock which the deceased wore over his other clothing. It was a blue stockinette with large white stripes running across. Having put this on, I proceeded to equip myself with a false stomach in imitation of the horrible deformity of the swollen corpse. This was soon effected by means of stuffing with some bedclothes. I then gave the same appearance to my hands by drawing on a pair of white woolen mittens and filling them with any kind of rags that offered themselves. Peters then arranged my face, first rubbing it well over with white chalk and afterward blotching it with blood, which he took from a cut in his finger. The streak across the eye was not forgotten and presented a most shocking appearance.